I'm doing a zoom now with Mexico. How was the speech? Yes, sir. Yes, Bienvenidos a todos. Es un gusto contar con ustedes para otra presentación del Rabino Y.Y. Jacobson desde Monsey, New York. Eh, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Y vamos a tener preguntas al final. Y solamente esperamos a que el Rabino ya esté listo para poder iniciar. Muchas gracias. Pues agradecerle a Spiritual Revolution y Shevet Ajim por otra oportunidad más de hacer esta plática y qué, qué mejor que en esta época, a pocos días antes de Kipur. ¿Se escucha muy mal? Ah. Eh, we want to thank you, Rabbi, so much for another opportunity. It was amazing to have you here in Mexico uh, a few months ago, and we had the privilege also having you in Zoom. And now, again, in this time of the year, that it's so special. We know that you're gonna prepare us to connect the properly way to Yom Kippur. So it's a big challenge, but we know you, you know how to make it. And thank you so much again for the opportunity and for your time. Um, if somebody has any questions, so they could write it in the chat or they could also raise their hand and we could put them live after the class. So thank you again to Spiritual Revolution and Shevet Ahim and enjoy the class. Okay, beautiful. Could you just give me a thumbs up that you could see me and hear me? <laughs> perfect. perfect, perfect, perfect. Let me straighten out the camera and we'll begin here. Okay. So, thank you so much. You know how to do it in the center? You could do it. What? Okay, and it's clear, everything yeah. is clear? Yeah, I asked the people if they can hear good, so everybody can hear. Here okay, here. maybe you can unmute the people. You know how to I mean, mute them, mute them now. Everybody is mute. Oh, perfect. Okay. So, first of all, thank you so much, Rabbi Moshe. Thank you very much, Rabbi Isaac. Thank you very much, Rabbi Yeshua. Thank you very much, Spiritual Revolution. Thank you very much, Shevet Achim. Thank you very much to the entire community of Mexico. All of you who are joining, all of you who will be joining, all of you who may watch a replay, but uh, your community is one of the most uh, inspiring and incredible and empowering and in unified communities with so much love and so much camaraderie and so much joy and brotherhood and a sense of Ahavat uh, Hashem, Ahavat HaTorah, Ahavat Yisrael. Indeed, my visit to you was right before the pandemic erupted and it was uh, short but extraordinarily inspiring and uh, I am thrilled and privileged to be back here with you even though we're socially distant and we're communicating through Zoom but we are spiritually unified as never before and I wish and I begin by wishing each and every one of you a Shana Tova, a Shana Mavurechet, a Gmar Chatima Tova to you, to your loved ones, to all your family members, to your community, to all of our, excuse me, to all of our brothers and sisters. May this be, year be an amazing and incredible year for all of you. Materially, Jewishly, spiritually, Hashem should fulfill all of your heart's desires. For a year filled with happiness, health, prosperity, and much nachat, and all good things. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. The same to you. Amen. So, 
the theme that I was asked to address tonight is somewhat of a strange title. As you saw probably in the flyer and the posters or the WhatsApps, the holiness of your sins. Now, obviously, this is a, uh, an enigmatic, very uh, strange title, the holiness of your sins. We're trying to get rid of our sins. Since when did our sins become holy? But this is exactly what I want to explore with you tonight. You know, there are different approaches to the month of Elul, to the month of Rosh Hashanah, to the, to the time of Rosh Hashanah, to the time of Yom Kippur. And as the Gemara says in Tractate Erevin, Talmud Erevin, page 13, some of you have learned it not long ago in Daf Yomi, Elu ve'elu divri alekim chayim. Jewish history has had different streams, different approaches, different perspectives. One thing that didn't change in Yiddishkeit was Torah and mitzvahs. We always observed and observed the same 613 mitzvahs, the same Shabbat, the same Passover, the same Sukkot, the same Yom Kippur. Same mitzvahs, the same tefillin, the same talis, the same kiddush, the same davening, even if there were variations in texts and traditions and minhagim. We had the same text, Torah Shabbat Sav, Torah Shabbat But within approaches to Judaism, there's a lot of diversity. The famous expression of the Zohar, Shivim Ponem Torah. There are 70 faces to the Torah. The Arizal writes that every single pasuk, every single mitzvah, every story, every concept in Torah has 600,000 different possible interpretations because there are 600,000 generic Jewish souls. And every soul has its own unique interpretation of the way it understands and absorbs Torah. Which means there's no one size fits all. There are different approaches, different perspectives. And one of our challenges as Jews is to be able to respect another perspective, even if it's not the one I grew up with or the one I'm comfortable with. We have the Torah and the mitzvahs that unites us. Torah achas l'kulana. There's one Torah for all the Jewish people. And when we start playing around with that and cutting some and adding others, ultimately we lose the integrity. But within the Torah itself, there's so many different perspectives and dimensions and layers and approaches. When you read Gemara, you see the arguments don't stop, but they could respect each other. They can appreciate each other, even if they disagree with each other. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillo, Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda, Reb Shimon and Reb Yoisi, Reb Yochanan and Rish Lakish, Rav and Shmuel, Abaya and Rav, Ravina and Rav Ashi, and so on and so on and so forth. The whole culture of Talmud is a culture of debate, but it teaches us how to debate. How to debate and remain normal. How to debate and remain loving. How to debate and remain connected. How to debate and not become, not make it personal. Not become vindictive. It's not easy. It's a challenge, it's a nisayon, it's a test of the Jewish people. But it's one we must overcome. And very much at this time of the year, you see different approaches. And maybe if I can express it in a humorous way, there were those who took the approach that when you go to the court, Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and you go into the court, the approach has to be plead guilty. That's the approach. Shamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu. We sinned, we betrayed, we stole. You plead guilty and you say it's even worse than you thought. You plead guilty on all counts. I am bad, bad, bad. I did horrible things. And I know I deserve great punishment. But I beseech the judge and I try to arouse his mercy and his compassion and his rachamim to have mercy on my sinning soul, on me the sinner, and exonerate me from guilt. That's one approach to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Very, very much focused on the negative very much focused on the judgment, very much focused on guilt, very much, much focused on, on how, how difficult it is, how scary it is, how horrible it is, and plead guilty on all counts. One approach. There's another approach. Other approach is the exact opposite. Maybe it's more the Hasidic approach. The approach was you come into the court and you maintain innocence. I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And therefore, you come in with a smile, maybe you even dance a little bit, maybe you say, maybe you fabreng a little bit, 
and you say, listen, I'm innocent. If you research it, you'll see I'm innocent. I'm pure. I'm good. I'm holy. And the judge knows it more than anybody else. He's my father. He loves me. He knows me. I'm innocent. And all the accusations are either lies or they're just external stuff. And therefore, you celebrate, you're optimistic, you're happy. You know that very soon the innocence is going to come out because my soul is a chelik elikami mal mamish. Who's right? Who's right? <laughs> Who's right? Somebody told me that recently there's a third approach. And the third approach is you come into court and you plead insanity. You plead insanity. That's a new approach, a recent approach. Yeah. I'll tell you a very interesting story. I heard it from the person himself. He's a reconstructionist rabbi, spiritual guy, spiritual person. Name is Rabbi Paley. He told me the story. He shared with me the story. You remember President Bill Clinton was having a difficult time when they, the story started to go around about his ma'asim tovim, his deeds that he did in the White House with Monica Lewinsky. And he was close to being impeached for his uh, immoral behavior. And at that time, the president convened a meeting with clergy people, with religious leaders in Cincinnati of different religions and denominations. And this spiritual Jewish leader was invited. He told me the story. And he said, I didn't want to just tell the president like with everybody else, you know, wish him good luck and take a picture and hang it on my office. I wanted to make an impact on him. So when I met President Clinton, I said, Mr. President, these words, it's time for you to do tshuva. And I was about to explain to Bill Clinton what tshuva is, what tshuva is. But he interrupts me. He says, yes, but I have a question for you. Which type of tshuva are you referring to? Are you referring to tshuva according to Rabbi Soloveitchik? Or are you referring to tshuva according to Rabbi Cook? This man tells me I was astounded. Bill Clinton asks me if it's the tshuva of Rabbi Soloveitchik or the tshuva of Rabbi Cook. And I'm already thinking, wow, you know more than 95% of American Jews about tshuva. And I turn to President Clinton and I say, Mr. President, of course I'm referring to the tshuva of Rav Cook." And he looks at me and he says, if so, I want to have a conversation with you. And after the meeting, he had a long conversation with this individual. What was he referring to? Basically, one of the books that one of his advisors gave him was a Jewish book about tshuva. Truva, the way it's accentuated in the teachings of Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik and Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Akoyan Cook. Rabbi Soloveitchik, a son of Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik, a grandson of Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik, Rabbi Chaim Briska, a great grandson of the Beis Halevi, from the family of Rabbi Chaim Valozhna, a student of the Vilna God, who represented the Litvisha Briska Derech, focuses very much on the Truva that represents the idea of I have to regret my sins express remorse, confess and say I'm sorry, and make a resolution for the future not to repeat, not to repeat it. In other words, truva is very much focused on the fact that I am human, I am weak, I am vulnerable, I am guilty, ashamnu bagadnu al and it's time to say I am embarrassed to regret it and to realize how deep I have fallen, to be able to be terrified by the consequences and to be able to move on. That's the approach of Rabbi Soloveitch. The approach of Rav Kook, who was a great student of Alajan, a great halachic authority, but also a great mystic and a poet and a spiritualist. His focus in tshuva and his works on tshuva, arata tshuva and other works is, tshuva means returning to the core self that never sinned. There's a core pure self that transcends all sin, transcends all corruption. The core of your identity was never engaged in sin. It remains divine and pristine and sacred and wholesome and pure. And sin is really an aberration of your natural quintessential divinity and holiness. And shuva means to come back to that, to return to that place that always remains wholesome and untarnished. So Bill Clinton 
asks this Jew, which tshuva do you want me to do? Do you want me to do the tshuva of Rabbi Soloveitchik or do you want me to do the tshuva of Rabbi Kook? He tells him, I want you to do the tshuva of Rav Kook. And Bill Clinton is very excited to hear that answer. Now here again, it's a little bit oversimplistic to say Rabbi Soloveitchik only spoke about this and Rav Kook only spoke about this. But the point is that there's two different ways of looking at it, or primarily two different ways. One is, Aseretim Eitshuva, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I focus very much on the guilt, on the negativity, on the toxicity, and I want to correct it, which is important. Another focus is more on the fact, no, you're pure, you're beautiful, you're innocent, you're majestic, and all the sins are external, and you got to get rid of the facades and the external layers. And really, both components are important. We have to remember that our core is always pure and always holy and is never, ever broken and can never be distant from Hashem. On the other hand, because of that, I say, I want to get rid of all the blemishes and all the externalities and all the transgressions and all the toxicity and all the anxiety and all the stress that doesn't belong to me. It's alien to me. The question is, which point is emphasized more? And I think today it's extremely important for people to understand both of these perspectives. Because sometimes I see people are so driven by guilt and guilt and guilt, and these days become so hard for them, like toxic. They're so, they dread it, and they're scared as though God is sitting in heaven with a long white beard and waiting to take revenge and punish them. God forbid. God is your greatest fan. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He wants you to have the most amazing, blessed, successful life. He wants you to be able to be a happy person physically, materially, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. This is not a judgment of a stranger who couldn't care less about you or a vindictive judge who wants to take revenge and teach you a lesson. You're talking about someone who created you and conceived you in absolute and infinite and unconditional and non-negotiable love. So really it's a time of the deepest closeness when all the layers are removed and yourself emerges and then you say, all these sins, they don't belong to me. But tonight, I want to go one step deeper. And this one step deeper really reconciles and brings together both perspectives and maybe even unifies them to some degree. There's a fascinating Talmud teaching in the Talmud. Talmud says in Yuma, page 86, Rish Lakish, who was a Baal Tshuva. Rish Lakish says that Tshuva out of love, repentance out of love has the power to transform your previous sins into mitzvot. Zdonot nasolok is It's a very strange statement. Rish Lakish is saying that when I do Tshuva out of love, all my previous sins become mitzvot. What does this mean? The Maharsha, one of the great commentators, is very disturbed by this. What does this mean? If I did all these sins, they all become mitzvahs because I repented? Why? Maybe God will forgive me, but why should all my sins and transgressions be transformed into mitzvahs, into positive deeds, into holy deeds? What is the meaning of this? What is the explanation of this? And in order to really appreciate this, I'm going to share with you a very, very deep teaching. And I'm telling you, this is deep. You're going to have to concentrate and tune into it. The source is the works, a few of the Sfarim of Rabbi Tzadik HaKohen of Lublin, one of the great Hasidic masters who passed away 1900 in Poland. And he writes this in his Sfarim, and it's based on one of the works of Rabbi Chaim Vital, a student of the Arizal, known as Arba Me'ot Shekel Kesef. That's safe. One of the great questions of yours is, how do we have free choice if God knows everything about the future? If God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, how can I have choices tomorrow? Because God can't make a mistake. So if God knows that tomorrow I'm going to do so and so, it seems that I'm forced. I'm forced to behave this way. I have no choice. And if you tell me that I do have a choice and I can defy God's knowledge, then it means God's knowledge is not perfect. He's not omniscient. His knowledge is blemished. His knowledge is flawed. His knowledge is lacking. How can that be? This is a question the Rambam raises in Hilchus Tshuva, Perik Hay, the fifth chapter of the Laws of Repentance. And it's discussed in many works of the Rishonim, the Acharonim, Jewish philosophers, and Jewish Kabbalists and mystics. Sfarim of Musar, Machshava, Kabbalah, Chassidut. 
and Chakira, Jewish philosophy, and even works of halacha. How do we reconcile the two? Either God knows everything, or I have a choice. If I have choices, then God doesn't know because I can do what I want, what I choose to do. And if I can't, I have to fulfill God's knowledge, so then I'm compelled in a certain direction. There's no freedom. That's one of the great, great questions. And all the commentators struggle with this. The Rambam himself says that there's no way we can understand God's knowledge, how God knows, and therefore I can't answer this question and tell you how the two things work. God knows everything, but there's also free choice. And the writer, Rabbi Avram Ben David from Pasquari, is from France, who writes commentary on the Mishnah Torah, criticizes the Rambam. He says, why do you start asking questions and you don't give good answers? If you don't have a good answer, don't ask the question. And the commentators of the Rambam try to defend the Rambam, Dara Sameach and Avay Samelech and many other commentators on the Rambam. But tonight, I want to share with you one approach. It's a very deep approach. It's a difficult approach. It's not an easy approach. But this is the approach that's adopted by Rabbi Tzadik HaKoyen of Lublin, and he bases it on the teachings of the Arizal. And he says, in order to appreciate this, we have to become comfortable with the concept of paradox. Now, in the times of your, nobody liked the idea of paradox. Things had to make sense logically. Today, cutting edge science and physics is all about paradox. Quantum mechanics is filled with paradoxes. Subatomic particles moving clockwise and counterclockwise simultaneously. Schrodinger's cat both dead and alive. Light being both a particle and a wave simultaneously. Quantum field, quantum physics is filled with paradoxes. And nobody blinks because we know that when you get to the underlying core of matter, you're filled with paradoxes. And to try to make sense of it in your rational brain is ludicrous and ridiculous because you can't wrap your rational brain around it. This is one of the fascinating discoveries of our generation. Einstein said God doesn't play dice with the universe. Heisenberg said, of course he does. Well, in quantum mechanics, it's not just playing dice. It's filled, rattled with, par rattled with paradox. The big question of God knowing the future and we choosing we having the ability to make choices is a question of paradox. There's real paradox here. There's real contradiction here. Come to Tzadik HaKayin of Lublin and he says, I want to tell you something. There are two worlds, two parallel universes. There is the universe in which we live in, in which we have free choice. I decide what I'm going to do. I decide what I'm going to say. I decide what I'm going to think. I decide how to live my life. I am the author of my own biography as well as you. That's one world. He says there's another universe in which God knows the future and God orchestrates the future and God takes care of the future and divine providence pervades everything in a person's life. So you say, but the two are a contradiction. If God knows the future and God orchestrates the future, then it's not my choice. Reb Tzaddik says, yes, there are two parallel universes. There is complete paradox. We will never wrap our brain around it. But in our world, there's absolute free choice. But here comes the clincher. And let's think about this. We all know that every single mitzvah has something called heksher mitzvah, which means the way you prepare for the mitzvah. Every mitzvah. I want to blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah, I have to cut the ram's horn and make it hollow so I should be able to blow. I want to shake a lulav on Sukkot, I have to harvest the branch of a palm tree, a myrtle, a willow, and a citrus. I want to eat in a sukkah on some sukkahs. I have to build a sukkah. I have to get lumber. I have to get schach. I have to build a sukkah. It doesn't come from nowhere. Every single mitzvah has what's called a heksher mitzvah. You want to put on tefillin? You have to take the height of an animal. You have to develop it into leather, into parchment. You have to get ink. You have to write the scrolls. You have to build it, make the tefillin, and then you can wear tefillin. There is no mitzvah that doesn't have heksha mitzvah, the preparation for a mitzvah. And according to some views, preparing for a mitzvah is like the mitzvah itself. Now, here's my question to you. What's the heksha mitzvah for tshuva? What's the mitzvah that prepares us to be able to do tshuva? Just like every single mitzvah. You want to eat on Shabbos? You have to cook before Shabbos. You have to buy the food before Shabbos. Misha tarach of Shabbat, yochal Shabbat, the Gemara says in Avedazar. What's the heksher mitzvah of tshuva? What do you have to do 
in preparation for the mitzvah of tshuva? The answer is, what do you have to do in order to be able to do tshuva? You got it. You have to sin. <laughs> What's the preparation for the mitzvah of tshuva? You have to sin. If you don't sin, there's no tshuva. One second. But this doesn't make sense. You can't say that sin is a preparation for tshuva. Sin is a sin. It's not a hechsha mitzvah. Sin is a sin. Sin means you're betraying God's will. How could you call it the beginning and the preparation for tshuva? Here's the clincher. That's true. When I sin, it's not a preparation for tshuva. It's a bad thing to do. It's not a good thing. However, when I sit and later I do tshuva out of love, you know what happens? Retroactively, the sin is redefined into a hechsha mitzvah for tshuva. The sin assumes a new identity. When I commit this sin, it's just a sin. It takes me away from God. When I do tshuva after the sin, retroactively, la mafreya, the tshuva redefines the sin as a catalyst, as a springboard for tshuva out of love. Why? The Tanya explains that when somebody does tshuva out of love, the very fact that they sinned fuels their enthusiasm. It's like somebody who hasn't had water in a few days. And then you give them water, they appreciate it so much more. I remember there was no minion by us for a few months. And then there was an outdoor minion. And I went there one Matsuri Shabbat. And I heard the Chazan say Kaddish. And I had an opportunity to say, Amen Mavarach after a few months. And I found myself crying. Why? Because what I didn't, you don't do something for a few months and then you'd go back to it. You appreciate it. You appreciate it in a different way. When somebody is ill and they regain their health, they don't take it for granted. When somebody, God forbid, has a difficulty breathing and then they're given back their ability to be able to inhale and exhale normally, they don't take it for granted. Every breath is a miracle. Every time I take a step, it's a miracle. My circulatory system is a miracle. My digestive system, my urinary system. But we take these things for granted because we always have them. When somebody loses something, then they don't take it for granted. When somebody sins, when somebody destroys their life, when somebody makes bad mistakes, and then they learn from the mistake, and they transform their lives for the future, the mistake itself becomes now part of their new discovery. Because without the mistake, they would have never experienced such a passion and such a sincerity and such a trans transformation in their life. They tell a beautiful story about the legendary Henry Watson. He was the head of IBM. And they say that one of his managers made a horrible mistake in business and he cost the company, IBM, a loss of $10 million. And this manager was devastated. And he comes in the next day to Watson and he offers his resignation papers. He wants to resign. No severance pay. They don't owe him anything. He feels so bad. He knows that he can't stay in the company. And he just resigns without any demands, without any expectations, just with an apology for what he has done to create such a loss for the company. And when Henry Watson hears what this man wants, he wants to just resign. He says, where are you going? He says, well, instead of you firing me and having to pay me severance pay, I'm just leaving the company and we're good. All I can do is apologize for the terrible thing I did. And Watson looks at him and said, resigning? You're not going anywhere. I just spent $10 million on your education. You're not going anywhere. The man stayed. He became one of the most dedicated employees in history. Such dedication you can't buy for money. Watson was smart. The worst thing that can happen to you after you make a mistake is that you don't learn from the mistake. But when a mistake becomes a source of learning and discovery, then it's not a mistake anymore. Then this very mistake brought you awareness that you could have never had without this mistake. That's what he told them. I just spent $10 million on your education. I'm not going to throw that, throw that out into the dustbin. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to waste such a crisis such an opportunity for awareness and education. When a Jew makes a mistake, when I make a mistake in my life, when you make a mistake in your life, whether it's willingly or unwillingly, whether it's caused by trauma or it's caused by some element in your nature or in your nurture and your bad choices, whatever it is, it's only a sin as long as I keep it that way. 
But the moment it becomes a source of tshuva, tshuva me ahava, it becomes a source and a catalyst and a springboard for new discovery, for new awareness, for metamorphosis, for transformation, then retroactively, it's not a sin, it's a heksher mitzvah. This is what prepared the ground. This was the, the basis. This is what created the foundation for such a deep level of connection to Hashem. That's why Rish Lakish says that when a Jew does tshuva out of love, that love is fueled by the terrible mistakes and then the sin itself is transformed into a mitzvah. Comes Reb Tzadik HaKoyin of Lublin and says something fascinating. He says, you know, as long as I sinned, it was my choice and therefore it was a terrible sin. When a person does tshuva out of love, you know what happens? You align your world with God's world. Remember, we spoke about the parallel universes. There is a world where Hashem knows everything and controls everything. There's a world in which I choose my life. Says Reb Tzadik, what is tshuva? Tshuva is you become one with Hashem. You realize that you're completely aligned with God. There's no separation whatsoever. So now, your choice was really God's choice. So your sin was God's choice. So what is your sin? It's really a mitzvah. Because from God's perspective, the whole purpose of everything was you should be able to do tshuva. It becomes part of a mitzvah of tshuva. So therefore, when you do tshuva, your world becomes completely aligned with God's world. There's no separation anymore. You're like a full partner with God. You're a manifestation of God. You're completely aligned with Hashem. And then it wasn't my choice anymore. It was Hashem's choice. And if it's Hashem's choice, it was certainly a mitzvah. So Yish Lakish says, your sin becomes a mitzvah. But as long as I don't do tshuva, now the two worlds are so different. They drift apart. There's Hashem's world where He knows and He controls and He navigates life. And then there's my world where I control and I choose. When I sin, my world has drifted away from Hashem's world. When I do tshuva, I bring back the two worlds. And then it wasn't my doing, it was Hashem's doing. And if it was Hashem's doing, then it was certainly beautiful. It was certainly holy. It was certainly good. Rapinchas Karitzer, the student of the Baal Shem Tov, once said, when we confess on Yom Kippur, we say, Asham nu, Bagad nu, Gazal nu, Dibarnu dofi, Al chetan nu, we, we sinned. Why plural? Why not singular? Imagine you come to your partner who you've harmed and you say, I want to apologize. We sinned. We lied. We betrayed. Or you tell that to your wife. She's not going to like that. You have to take accountability. Asham ti, bagad ti, gazal ti. I sinned. Not we. Who's this we? Who's this collective we? It's me. Different interpretations have been given to this enigma. Repinchus of Karitz said something very heavy. He said, Hashem nu means we. You're talking to Hashem. You and me together. al nu is you and me together. What does this mean? It means that I am guilty. I had a choice. But let's face it. Hashem is the one who created my Yetzirah. Hashem is the one who created a lot of circumstances that were very difficult. Hashem was the one who gave me a lot of tests and a lot of challenges. I'm not the only one who's guilty here. This was my choice, but it was also God's choice. We bring the two worlds together. Hashem nu, but God nu, gazal nu. And I know that if God wanted me to do this, then what does it mean? It means that from Hashem's perspective, this was a mitzvah. How can it be a mitzvah? It's a sin. Because from Hashem's perspective, the whole purpose is that I should transform darkness into light, that from these mistakes I should have an education and I should grow even to have a deeper relationship and then the sin will be transformed into a heksha mitzvah and the sin itself will become a mitzvah. If God was involved, it means that everything can be redeemed, everything can be repaired, everything can be corrected. You know, sometimes we look at our lives and we tell ourselves, I was so stupid, I was so foolish, I was such an idiot, I was so traumatized, I was abused, I was small-minded, I was petty, I made this mistake, that mistake, that mistake, that mistake, that mistake. And it's such a difficult burden to live with. And that's why we have so much guilt and so much anxiety and so much stress. And we feel like God is going to strike us down and punish us. But what the Pesachit is teaching us, based on the Gemara and Yuma Daf Pevav, is something so much deeper. And that is every mistake is only a mistake if you don't learn from it. 
If you can go into a deeper place, you can discover the holiness of your sins. You can discover how even though when you did it, it was not a good thing. It was not a good thing. Nonetheless, if this brings you to a new awareness, if this makes you grow, if this makes you appreciate truth, authenticity, MS, integrity, if this gives you a new appreciation of Yiddishkeit, of life, of meaning, of purpose, if this gives you a new relationship with yourself, with your soul and with God, then you know what happens? Then you go back in time and you redefine the Avera, you redefine the mistake as a catalyst and as a springboard for a new awareness and a new metamorphosis and a new transformatia. And as you guys say, for a new revolution. If this is what caused the revolution, the spiritual revolution, then it's not a sin anymore. Then my very mistakes, my downfall, my failure, my stumbling blocks, are transformed into extraordinary forces for good. They become a momentum, a catalyst for such powerful goodness, for such powerful holiness. According to this, the holy Rebbe Yitzchak of Barditchev, whose yard site is always right after, whose yard site is after Sukkot, explains something very, very special. He says, you know, the Pasuk says in Parshat Emor, Ulekachtem Lachem Bayomarishon, pre eats Hadar. On the first day, you should take a beautiful fruit, the four minim on Sukkot. And the Medrash says, Why does it say Bayom Harishon the first day? It's really the 15th day of the month. And the Midrash Rabbah answers, Rishon Lachesh Ben Avonot. It's the first day when Hashem calculates our sins. What is the meaning of this? On Yom Kippur, we're cleansed from all of our sins. The next four days, Jews are too busy to sin. We're building a sukkah, we're buying a lulav, we're preparing for the holidays. When is the first time you have the serenity and the comfort to sin? On the first day of Sukkot. That's why it's called Yom HaRishon, Rishon L'Cheshbon Avonot, the first day of calculating sins. Ask Shabli Vitzuka by Ditchev and Gdusha Slevi, come on, that's so pessimistic, that's so negative. The Torah really believes that the first day of Sukkot is going to be for Jews the first day when sins are calculated. Why don't we give more promise? Why are we more not optimistic and say the first day of Sukkot, they're not going to sin? It seems like such a negative and pessimistic approach. The first day of Sukkot is called Yom HaRishon because we all start sinning then and that's when the Cheshbon of Avonot starts. Why would a Jew sin on the first day of Sukkot? So the Baditshava says something beautiful. He says, you know, there's two types of tshuva. There's tshuva out of awe, tshuva me'ira, tshuva out of fear, and tshuva me'ava, tshuva out of love. Reish Lakish says in Yuma Pevav, when you do tshuva out of fear, it obliterates the sins. God treats your sins like mistakes. He forgives you. When you do tshuva out of love, he transforms the sins into mitzvot, as we explained, not So the Baditshava said as follows, generally, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the focus is more yira. The focus is on yira, fear. That's the focus. Tshuva out of fear. Sukkot is yimino techapkeni. Sukkot is a time of joy, a time of love, a time of affection. Then the tshuva is love. Tshuva me'ahava. So he says, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, God throws away all the sins. They're gone. They're cast away. He forgives you. Come Sukkot, Sukkot a Jew. Does true out of love with simcha, with enthusiasm, with positivity. What happens? Now all the sins become mitzvahs. So the Torah says, Rishon l'cheshbon avonot. First day of Sukkot is the time to recalculate all the sins. Because now we don't want to throw away the sins. Now the sins themselves are transformed into mitzvot. So it's Rishon L'Chesh Bonavonot. In our lives, we made mistakes. Some of us made mistakes in our marriages. Some of us made mistakes the way we educated our children. Some of us made mistakes the way we treated our parents or siblings. Some of us made mistakes in our own personal life. You could look back at your life and say, Oi, I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm a shlemiel. I'm a shlemazel. I'm a nudnik. I'm a moron. I'm an idiot. 
Amala Yutzlachnik. You could do that. We liked, we, we, we tend to do that. But there's a much deeper, a much deeper approach to life. A much deeper approach to life is to understand, yes, in our world we have free choice, but there's another world in which God planned it all. And when you can learn from every mistake, and when you can stand up from every failure, and when you can rise from every stumbling block, and you can tell yourself, you know what? Let me ask myself how I can transform my life, how I can transform the future, how I could learn from the past to be able to become a sensitive, genuine, real, authentic, godly human being. Then you know what happens? Then the world where you had free choice becomes one with the world where Hashem chose. And then it's revealed that it was all a mitzvah. It was all part of your mission, part of your plan, because this is what brought you to greatness. This is what caused you to fulfill your ultimate mission. It's an incredible teaching because it takes us away from that sense of depression and guilt and all those calculations our whole life. What if, what if, what if I would have said this and done this and not do this? And people sit and wallow in the sense of sadness and despondency and depression. But that's not how you're supposed to live life. You're supposed to live life right now, the power of now. God creates the world right now. I have to be focused on my avoidance, Hashem, right now. I can't stay stuck in the past. I have to ultimately believe that even if there was mistakes, and even if there were serious mistakes, their whole purpose was ultimately to make me a better person to make me an ambassador of love, light, hope, healing, to allow my soul to fulfill my mission and to make changes around the people around me to bring more good and more light. And the negativity itself must become a springboard for extraordinary revolutionary acts of love and goodness because there is no light like the light that comes from the transformation of darkness. It is always the deepest light in the world. According to this, we're going to understand something else that's very profound, very, very deep. This is a teaching that comes from the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory. Very, very rich teaching. He says, what do we do on Rosh Hashanah? On Rosh Hashanah, we go for Tashlich. What's Tashlich? You throw away all your sins. You take all of your Averot and you throw them away into the water. They're gone. They're obliterated. They're in this water. I'm free. And now you go back home. You got rid of your sins. That's Rosh Hashanah. What happens on Sukkot? On Sukkot, they had in the time of the Beis Hamikdash what's called Simchat Beit HaShoeva. What's Simchat Beit HaShoeva? The joy that came from drawing the water. The Mishnah says in Masachet Sukkah, if you, did not, if you did not see the joy of Beit HaShoeva, if you did not see the joy of drawing the water, you did not see joy in your life. They used to dance all night, every night of Sukkot. They would dance all night. And then at dawn break, they had a procession that would go from the Harabai, from the Temple Mount, down to a spring that was called the Shiloyach. It's still there, you could check it out. And they would draw water. They would draw water in a goblet of gold and bring the water back up to the Bet HaMikdash. And the Kohen would pour this water, Nisuch HaMayim, on the altar of the Bet HaMikdash every single day of Sukkot. And for this, they had this great joy and they danced all night. What is going on here? What is the mystery of Simchat Beit HaSheva? Listen to this. On Rosh Hashanah, we took our sins. We went to the water and we threw away our sins into the water. We got rid of them because it was truva out of fear, truva out of awe. Sukkot is truva out of love. So what's, what do we do now? Now we go back to the water. Now we collect the water. Now we draw the water. What are we doing? We're taking back our sins. We are reclaiming our mistakes. We are reclaiming our errors. We are reclaiming our distortions. We take the water, the water that has our sins, our mistakes, our problems, our failures, our brokenness, and we bring it up to the Mizbeach, and we pour it on the altar. 
and it becomes holy. Our sins become holy. They become a korban, an offering to Hashem. Like Rish Lakish said, Zdoinois, Zdonot, Nasalok is achiyat. We go and we reclaim our mistakes because there's two phases in life. There's a phase in life where I get rid of my mistakes, where I say I'm sorry and I say this is not for me. I get rid of it. And then there's a deeper phase in life where I reclaim it and I realize that this was the journey that was necessary for me in order to be able to become the human being I'm capable of becoming. Yes, I was on a mountain and then I came down from the mountain and I descended into the valley. But from the valley, I can climb up a second mountain, which is far taller, far more majestic, far more beautiful than the first mountain. It's by going down and then coming up that I can achieve my ultimate, ultimate goal. This is the second phase, the phase where you go back, you reclaim all your water, you take it back, you own it. Instead of telling yourself, you're guilty, you're a loser, you're bad, you're evil, you're negative, you discover a shamnu, a gadnu. You discover the sacredness in your mistakes. I discover the light that exists in all my mistakes. I can't begin with it. I have to begin with tears, but I could reach it. I could reach it. The Radzine Rebbe, the holy Radzine Rebbe once said, very, very deep, very deep. He said, the ultimate tshuva, the ultimate tshuva is when you reach a place in life that you realize that you don't have to do tshuva. When you reach a place in life where you realize that you don't have to do tshuva because everything you did was really, really, really part of God's purpose to help you heal, to help you grow. But, he said, in order to reach that place, you first have to do real tshuva. <laughs> you can't jump to that place. And, hey, I don't have to do tshuva, it's all good. No, 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 that's garnish, that's fake. First, you have to do tshuva. You do real tshuva. You have to regret it. And then you'll reach the ultimate tshuva, where you'll realize you don't have to do tshuva. Not because you celebrate the bad, but because you reach the place of complete oneness. Everything in your life is oneness. Dveikut. And then all your mistakes have been transformed. There's an exceptional teaching of the Maharal. The Maharal of Prague has a sefer called Nisivot Olam. Nisiv HaTshuva. Perik Aleph. And he tells us a story. Extraordinary parable in the world of the Maharal. And this is what he says. Open your hearts. Maral of Prague, Rabbi Yehuda Leva of Prague, passed away Chai Elul, the 18th of Elul, 1609. He's buried in Prague. One of the seminal thinkers of the Middle Ages. The Maral says there was once a man who went into the palace of the king and the king gave him his most expensive, exquisite, and beautiful vessel to use. And the man was negligent and he dropped the vessel and it shattered into pieces. Oy, 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 what do I do? He realizes what he did. He's so regretful and remorseful. And he goes to seek the advice of a wise man in the empire. He thinks this is a man of wisdom. He'll be able to guide him. And the wise man looks at what happened and he says, this is bad. <laughs> if I were you, I would run away. I would become a fugitive because this is bad. This crime is going to pursue you for the rest of your life. You better get out of here fast. He thinks to himself, maybe this wise man doesn't really understand. So he consults an advisor of the king, somebody who's close to the king, somebody who knows the king. And this man hears the story, looks at the shattered vessel, and he says, oy, 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 oy. this is treason. You're going to be executed for this. Oh, do I feel bad for you? And he says, eh, I can't get any advice from this guy. He thinks to himself, let me go to the craftsman. Let me go to the person who sculptured and designed the vessel. He certainly will know how to fix it. And he comes to the craftsman, and the craftsman looks at what happened. And he says, Oy, va, voy. but with a lot, a lot, a lot of work, we can fix it. Not going to be easy, but with a lot of work, we can fix it. But I have to tell you, even after it's repaired, it's never going to look the same as it did. 
I'll try to see what I can do. I'll work hard. I'll repair it significantly, but it's never ever gonna be the same. And it's gonna be a lot of hard work. So the wise man couldn't help him. The advisor couldn't help him. And even the craftsman was not of great help. And at some point the man said, you know what? I have no choice. The only one who can help me is the king himself. And he walks in into the chamber of the king with a shattered vessel. And he opens up and he says, your majesty, this is what happened. And he tells him the story. I went to the wise man and I went to your advisor and I went to your craftsman. And this is all they, this is what they told me. Now I'm coming to you. And the king looked at him with loving eyes. And the king says to Maharal, said to him, my son, I'll tell you a little secret. I'll tell you a little secret that none of the above guys knew and know. What's the secret? The secret is that in my private, private chamber, I use broken vessels. It's the broken vessels that I cherish. It's the broken vessels that I really want. It's the broken vessels that I really need. They were trying to protect my honor. I understand it. I appreciate it. But deep down in my own intimate life, it's the brokenness that I cherish most. You're good. And the Maharal says, that's the meaning of what the Talmud Yerushalmi says in Maseches Makos. Sha'alu lechokma. They asked wisdom, what should happen to the sinner? And wisdom said, sin will pursue them. They asked prophecy, the advisor of the king, the prophet. What should happen to the sinner? And he said he was going to spiritually die. They asked Torah, the craftsman. The Torah is the blueprint of God's universe. What should be the fate of the sinner? And Torah said, let him bring an offering, a karban. And then they asked God, they asked Hashem, what should be the fate of a sinner? And Hashem said, Ya said Truva Viskaperlo. Let him do Truva, and all will be forgiven. Says the Maral, these are the four levels. He first goes to a wise man, no help. He goes to the advisor. <laughs> he goes to the craftsman. Even that is incomplete. When he comes to Hashem himself, to the king himself, the king says, It's perfect. Ya said Truva Viskaperlo. I use these broken vessels. If you could just realize that your brokenness is part of the king's plan. It's part of what the king wants, part of the king needs. And you'll realize the wholesomeness in your life. That is what ultimate truva is. This is where all the views and all the perspectives of truva become synthesized. They become synthesized because we realize that yes, we have to do tshuva for our sins. I want to regret my mistakes. I don't want to do them again. I want to get rid of them. I want to cleanse myself. I want to come back to my core. I want to come back to my neshama. I want to come back to Hashem. And then I go one step deeper and I realize, and all my mistakes were a preparation. They were the breeding ground. They were the catalysts. They were the springboards. They were the foundations upon which my ultimate spiritual mission can be fulfilled. My ultimate journey can be completed. My ultimate potential can be actualized and it can be materialized. My dearest friends, I want to share with you a little story. It's a story a very, you know, ancient, lovely story. About an old Chinese woman who lived in a little hut not far from the river. And every day she would take a pole that had two buckets hanging from it. She would place it on her on her neck and on her shoulder, go to the river, fill up the two barrels with water and go up the slope, come back to her little house 
So she had water to drink and to bathe and to quench her thirst and to water her plants, etc. One of the buckets was complete. The other one was filled with cracks. And every day the water would trickle out on the way up. And by the time she came home, it was half empty. And that broken bucket felt so depressed and was so jealous of the other bucket. And the old legend metaphoric story goes that this broken bucket started to cry and says to the lady, it's not fear, I'm so jealous of my friend. I come back half empty and he comes back full. And she said, tomorrow on the way back from the river, back home, I want you to look what is under you, my dear cracked barrel. And the next day when they were coming back from the river up the slope, the cracked barrel, the cracked bucket, looked under it and it saw that on the path going home, there were beautiful, beautiful lilies and roses and various flowers. On the other path, where the other bucket was walking, was going, there was nothing. And he said, what's this? And she said, when I purchased you, I knew about your cracks. I knew about your holes. So therefore I watered your path. I planted in your path all these flowers. And every day when we come up the slope, your cracks allow the water to trickle through and to water all of these beautiful plants that give so much fragrance and beauty to our home and our community. And when I read the story the first time a number of years ago, I thought to myself, ah, isn't this true about life? Each of us has our cracks. Each of us has our holes. Each of us has our things that are missing. And we could live our life and tell ourselves, eh, if only I was like you, if only I was perfect, if only I didn't have this struggle, if only I didn't have this trauma, if only, if only, if only, if only I would have done this, I would have done that, I would have done that, my bucket would be complete. There would be no holes, no cracks. But that's not life. God purchased you, God created you, and he knew about your cracks. He knows about your flaws. He knows about your challenges. He created them. He put you in this difficult situation. It wasn't a mistake but realize that it's your cracks that allow you to water the plants in a way that nobody else in the world can. It's your challenges and my challenges. It's my trauma and your trauma. It's my difficulties that allow me to fulfill a unique mission in this world. They allow me to bring a light that nobody else could bring. They allow me and they give me a sensitivity and a depth that nobody else has. They give me a wisdom and a fortitude and a sense of faith and resilience that nobody else has. They allow me to become a unique person that nobody else can become because every person is an indispensable note in God's cosmic symphony and every soul has its unique mission and purpose. Instead of focusing on your cracks, instead of focusing on your holes, realize that it's these very cracks that allow you to create a fragrance in the world that nobody else can create because of these cracks, because of your struggles, when you confront these cracks, when you transform them, when you learn from them, when you learn who you really are and you become the person you're supposed to become through them, then these cracks turn out to be your greatest blessing. They become a source of enrichment and a source of empowerment. I know it's hard for some of us to hear this because we're used to a story of self-loathing and self-deprecation and self-denigration. But this is the ultimate truth, my dear friends. God knows about your cracks. And as one Jewish singer once sang, he said, when I was young, I worshiped perfection. Now I look for things with cracks because they are what allow the light to come in. It's the cracks in my life that keep me humble, that keep me vulnerable, that keep me authentic. They allow the light to come into my life and they allow the light to ultimately transform my darkness. So my dearest friends, at these days of reckoning, these days of cheshbon ha-nefesh, of aser yisimei tshuva, the Gemara says, Dir shu Hashem bi himotzoi kru bi yoto karov, elu aser yitom ben hashem liyam ha-kippurim. These 10 days from Hashem to Yom Hashem says, search for me because I'm present. Call out to me because I'm accessible, because I'm close. This is a unique time of closeness, of intimacy. We have now the ability to confront our demons, our skeletons, our traumas, and not only not to be afraid of them, but to transform them, to realize that they are part of our journey to turn us into extraordinary great human beings. Don't be afraid of any of them. This is the deepest time of love and the deepest time of closeness. Not just to do tshuva out of fear, but to do tshuva out of love. 
and therefore to transform your past, to transform your mistakes. They're only mistakes if we don't learn from them. When we learn from them, they become our greatest assets, our greatest sources of support. And I bless you, my dear brothers and sisters in Mexico and all of our brothers and sisters, that you and I should have the courage to be able to look at our lives this way, to be able to see the purpose and the meaning in everything, to be able to transform our darkness into light, our sins into mitzvahs, to be able to know that Hashem's love to each and every one of us is absolute and unconditional and non-negotiable. And I tell you, my dearest friends, that this year should be the most successful, amazing, brilliant year in your life, a year in which you maximize your potentials and a year in which you have the wisdom and the fortitude and the serenity to be able to look at all your past failures and mistakes and not only not get downtrodden and disappointed and frustrated and depressed, but on the contrary, realize that this is your unique mission and purpose. And when you have the perspective and God's grace, you can transform it all and create the most amazing year for yourself and your loved ones, one of health and happiness, prosperity, nachas, one filled with incredible meaning, a year of true healing, a year of true redemption. Amen. Shana tova, gmar chatima tova, and thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. Uh, a lot of people are writing that they're speechless about your words, and they're so inspired that there is no questions. It's so clear, and they're writing that they want you here in Mexico. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to come to Mexico. You got to speak to the Corona office. <laughs> <laughs> but I have one question that um, I think it's important to ask. Mm -hmm. Somebody is asking that what do you think about if seeing mm -hmm. the scene is a, a way to come close to Hashem, What do you think about sin, like to do a sin, lishma? Like, um, I don't know how to explain it, but like to provoke yourself to do a sin. Yeah, so you have to be very careful with this because the Yetzahara, you understand, Rabbi Moshe, the Yetzahara could use this speech very, very nicely. So you have to be very careful. The Mishnah says in Masachet Yuma, Somebody who says, I'm going to sin and do tshuva. It's not the right way to go. The Gemara does say, Sometimes a sin lishma could be greater than a mitzvah shalolishma. The Gemara speaks there about Yael. Yael invited Sisra. Right? She invited Sisra to her tent. I hope you remember the story in the book of Judges, chapter 5. And the Gemara says that she slept, she was intimate with Sisra seven times in order to get him exhausted and give him milk so he could fall asleep so she could kill him and get rid of the arch enemy of the Jewish people. The Gemara speaks there about Lloyd's daughters, what they did. So there are unique situations and times when a person says, listen, I know I'm doing the wrong thing, but I'm doing the wrong thing and really it's the, it's the, it's, it's the, right, it's the right thing to do. Uh, the Chassam Sofer writes, unbelievably, he writes that Aaron, Aaron HaKoyen, built the golden calf. He built the golden calf. Why? You know what he says? He says something incredible. Chassam Sofer writes this. Because the Jews murdered Chur, the son of Miriam, they killed Chur, because he was protesting the golden calf. And Aaron realized if they kill him, and they create an Avodah Zarah, there's going to be no hope. They're going to be so tainted and bruised spiritually, there'll be no hope. So he took upon himself the sin of creating the golden calf so the Jewish people won't be blamed. Fascinating. And the Chassam Soifer says that the Medrash bases, this is the idea why he became the Kohen Gadol. He was chosen as the high priest of Israel because he sacrificed his spirituality for the sake of Jewish people. Not his physicality, his spirituality. He engaged in something that seemed like Havodah Zarah to save the Jewish people. It's also an Averi Lishma. So we do have the concept. But I would say that generally you have to be very, very cautious and very, very careful because it's very easy to be biased and very, very easy to fool yourself and say, oh, I do an Averi Lishma. And we know a lot of people who are great 
but they deceive themselves. They lie to themselves and they use it in a manipulative way just to say everything is holy and everything is spiritual and everything is good. And that's why these are things that you have to be very, very cautious. You have to make sure that you have a real mentor who really can guide you and, uh, and uh, mentor you in questions of uh, such uh, importance. Okay, great answer. Um, there is somebody that want to ask, I could put him live, Rabbi? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Unmute him, unmute him. Zach, te tienes que te tienes que quitar el mute y prender la cámara. English, English. English is fine. I know English. English. Hi. First of all, thank you very much. It's so lovely and a privilege to learn from you. If you can indulge me on three questions, one of them is a um, confirming question and two are regular questions. The first is the we. Is that that God is a partner in the sin, hoping that we, the human, will use it as a catalyst for good? The second is, isn't tshuva out of fear not a sincere tshuva because you're just afraid of your own skin, of your own life, of, you know, all these bad things, not out of sincere love and desire to be completely whole with your creator? And the third is, if tshuva is defined as a complete alignment with God himself, there's no separation. So can it be said that it, a Jew in human form can never have complete and true tshuva until it's afterlife? So. Okay, wow. <laughs> Three intelligent, intelligent questions. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful questions. Answer, let's go in the order. The answer to the first question is yes. Again, this is a very sensitive teaching. I, I shared with you stuff that's usually not shared. I'm just telling this to you because uh, a lot of Jews feel, you know, this is dangerous stuff. I'm teach I feel today we have to reveal the depth, the depths of Torah. For many generations, we just focused on halacha and concrete, which is beautiful and amazing and incredible. But I think we live now in a generation right before Mashiach we have to reveal the secrets of Torah. Right. So the secrets of Torah say that Hashamnu is me and God together, yeah. In other words, there's a purpose here. And the Gemara says at the end of Masechus Sukkah, that God says, I'm the one who ultimately, Asher Hareyoti, I'm the one who created the Sahara. I made right. a lot of this mess, right. which right, right. in many ways is good news because that means that there is a positive purpose as we explain. Yes. In terms of your, in terms of the second question, what was your second question? The um, that true tshuva, sincere tshuva, comes oh, tshuva only out of tshuva love, tshuva. not out of fear, yes. because you're just worried for yourself. Okay, beautiful. There's two types of fear. You're referring to fear of punishment. I'm afraid yeah. that if I don't do tshuva, God is going to strike me. Yeah. That, that's not even tshuva out of fear. That's very primitive. Right. <laughs> that's a very primitive. That's just selfish. There's no relationship. Right, right, right. It's right. like I don't cheat on my wife. I don't cheat on my wife because if she finds out, she's going to throw me out of the house yeah. and she won't cook dinner for me anymore. <laughs> okay, that's not a relationship. Okay. The Maral says that a Jew who serves Hashem out of fear of punishment or because they want reward in the next world is not serving God. They're serving themselves. Basically, I want a good meal. I want my wife to do my laundry, so I'm nice to her. I don't care about her. <laughs> That's a very primitive form of Judaism. Right. And I'm going to tell you something. Some people don't know anything else. They think that's Judaism. You mm -hmm. serve God in order to get a good seat in the world to come, in the theater, or you serve God because you don't want to get punished. They don't realize yeah. it's completely selfish. There's nothing to do with yeah. God. There's no relationship there. Right. The Maral says that's not... It, it, listen, if that's what motivates you not to sin, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. But it's a very, very low level. <laughs> when we speak about fear, we mean something much deeper. We mean tshuva out of awe, tshuva out of reverence. You understand a very different type yes. of tshuva. Tshuva out of, and not, the, not, not so much tshuva out of closeness, but tshuva out of a sense of awe. In terms of your third question, listen, you're right and you're wrong. That's a real okay. Jewish answer. <laughs> sure. God is infinite. So therefore, tshuva never ends. 
But even in this world, a Jew can do complete tshuva. Because in a way, the unity that we can experience with Hashem in this world is deeper than in any other world. Yes, there are things that only can happen after life. In Olam Haba and Gan Eden, because we don't have a body. On the other hand, as the Mishnah says, Yafesh Ha'achat B'Tshuva Ma'asim Toivim B'Olam Ha'azim B'Kol Chai Olam Haba. Tshuva in this world, one hour is better than the whole life of Olam Haba. Because there's an intimacy with Hashem that you can experience in this physical world that you can't even experience in the spiritual worlds. So a Jew can absolutely achieve ultimate oneness in this world, even though we have to realize that because Hashem is infinite, that journey never, ever ends. Thank you very much. Yeah. Reb Moshe, somebody asks here, somebody asks yeah. in the chat, if a person who sinned his whole life, can he be as great as somebody who always kept the Torah? Is that fear or it's not fear? Okay, so here is your issue. You're looking at it as a competition. <laughs> competition is, he sinned his whole life, I'm jealous. And now he does truva and he's forgiven. Look at it this way. That's the problem. We look at Judaism as something that's like, a, it's a point system. You do mitzvot, you go to paradise. You do sins, you go to purgatory. It's not fear. That guy sinned his whole life. Why is he going to paradise? But look at it differently. What of Judaism means that you manage to live life in the healthiest way. So let's say you exercise every day and you eat healthy and you feel good. And then there's a guy, his whole life, he was obese and overweight and depressed. And at the end of his life, he turns himself around. What are you jealous of? What are you jealous? Great. Wish him great. You don't have to be jealous. Torah and mitzvahs is not a point system, and it's not fear. He's winning bunk competition. He's going to get cotton candy. Look at it as a way of living the truest life, the deepest life. The fact that a person later in his life did tshuva, that's wonderful. Now, are there advantages in being a tzaddik and not being a bal tshuva? Of course, there's an advantage in this and an advantage in this. That's how, that's how you should look at it. Somebody asks here a question. The real thing is to lose the nearest relationship of love with Hashem. That's true. The ultimate concept of Yirat Hashem, of fearing Hashem is, not that I'm afraid that he's going to do something, but I'm afraid to lose such a beautiful, beautiful relationship. That is very, very true. Uh, Rabbi another... Isaac wants to ask something, but he's, we're, we're keeping distance, so he's going to come in camera. One question, Rabbi. Uh, the, the, all the things that uh, a person's done have to have to to is related to the tikkun. So a person make a sin and have to correct that sin, and that's the tikkun of of the person, or doesn't have to. That is not related. Listen. If, if I did a sin, then my focus has to be how this sin could now bring me closer to my tikkun. Before I do a sin, I don't say, okay, let me go sin, and then it'll become part of my tikkun. That's not a way to live. A person doesn't say, I'm going to go hurt myself. I'm going to get sick. So therefore, I'm going to get healthy, and I'll appreciate my life much more. That's not a way to live. A person lives according to a lifestyle that is healthy. But if a person, for whatever reason, made a mistake and I failed, now my focus has to be how I could use this as an opportunity for growth and tikkun that I would have not happened, I would have not happened, happened without it. That's how I have to look at it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Yeah. I don't know if there is more questions. I see more questions. You, Moshe, you want me to take more questions? Yeah, it's up. Yeah, it's up to you, Rabbi. Okay, I can take more questions. Okay, you you want to read it? Yeah, I could read it. Let me just see. The questions that are not in English, I can't read. But uh, let me let me let me. The questions in English, I can read. Okay, how do I let go of blaming myself? and instead focusing on tshuva. Also, if Hashem responds to who we are and what we want and do, how is it sometimes that what we want doesn't happen? 
how do I open myself, so, myself up to Hashem's perspective? Okay, great questions. The answer is self-blame comes from the Yetzir Hara. Self-blame doesn't help anybody. Self-blame makes people miserable and it's not coming from a good place. Whenever you see a mind going to self-blame, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, don't stay there. This is the Eight Sahara wants to get you depressed. We think that guilt is a holy thing. It's not a holy thing. It's a bad thing. When you start feeling guilty, I'm a bad person, I'm a horrible person, it leads to depression. It leads to trauma. It leads to paralysis. You don't want to go there. The focus has to be, I am God's child. My soul is a piece of Hashem. I'm pure. And now I want to fix and I want to get rid of my dirt. Why? Because I want to live a life that's true to myself. I want to live a life that brings out my inner beauty. That's tshuva. When the focus becomes how bad you are, it's not going to help you. In terms of our davening, yes, tefillah is really the idea of opening yourself up to Hashem's perspective. Sometimes Hashem answers yes, sometimes He answers no, and sometimes His answer is, I have something much better in stock for you. So the idea of tefillah is aligning yourself. Tefillah means aligning, connection. Aligning yourself with God's vision for you and God's vision for the world. You get up and you say, Hashem, you unzipper my lips. Let me be a conduit for you today. I want to be your shliach, your ambassador in this world to fulfill your plan. That is very deep work. When we do that work, we live a day that is without stress, without anxiety. You don't have to take responsibility for everything. And most important thing is, you could be a free person. You could be a free person because you have a partner. You're like a co, you're a co uh, creator with Hashem. Next question. If our mistakes are part of Hashem's plan, and if we keep blaming ourselves for not being able at the time to do something that really seemed the correct thing to do, is this the Eight Sahara? And Hashem really didn't want it to happen. And that's why it didn't happen, because of our mistakes. Okay, here is the rule. Before you sin, we have free choice. And we have to use our free choice to do what Hashem wants. After you sin, after, there's going to be two approaches. The Yetzirah wants to get you depressed. The Yetzirah wants to tell you you're bad, 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 bad. You're evil, you're horrible, you smell, you're disgusting, you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn in purgatory, God hates you. Don't let that happen. In many ways, that's worse than the sin. Because the sin itself, you can do tshuva. For these thoughts of depression, you can't do tshuva. Don't let that happen. The thought has to be, yes. Ultimately, this was part of Hashem's plan for one reason. Because this could bring me to tshuva. This could bring me to a much deeper, deeper relationship with Hashem. And when all I'm doing is blaming myself, just blaming, 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 it's not coming from a holy place. And yes, sometimes we did not have choices. Many of the things we have done, we did not have choices. We were either stupid or immature or childish or locked up or afraid. And ultimately it's part of God's plan, let's face it. And I have to embrace it and say, you know what? I'm gonna learn how to grow from, from this. Next question. <laughs> if the truth is just, look from a perspective that we are really good and everything is okay, then why is there such a focus in tefillah that we are guilty? Good question, good question. So I'm now gonna give you a teaching and it's gonna change the way you daven, okay? On slichot, every day, and Yom Kippur, we say these words, lecha Hashem hadstaka velanu boshet hapanen. To you, God, there is righteousness. Shame belongs to us. How do we look at this? God is good, I'm bad. But now I want you to see it from a different perspective. Who are you? You're one with Hashem. That's true. You're one with God. What we're saying is something else. Lecha Hashem adzdaka. You're righteous. I, I'm part of Hashem. I'm also righteous. You're a chelik elekam imal. Vilanu boshet 
You know where shame comes from? Shame comes from when we disassociate from Hashem. When I tell myself I'm separate, I'm fragmented, I'm alone in the world. Now I'm full of shame, I'm full of guilt, I'm full of toxicity. All the guilt in davening is the guilt of a person who's disconnected, who's disassociated. So when you say, Hashem, you're good, you're compassionate, you're great, you're talking about yourself. You're part of Hashem. You're part of Hashem's infinity. The part that you're ashamed with, the part that you're guilty of is the part of you that doesn't really exist. It's the part of you that turns you into this lone individual who's separate from God, who's broken, who's shattered. When I'm separate from Hashem, then there's a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of toxicity, a lot of trauma. All the guilt and davening is not referring to you. It's referring to the you that thinks it's separate from Hashem. The moment you align yourself with infinity, you're part of infinity. This was one of the greatest teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and all of his students. That's how you have to be able to read all the davening. And you'll see it will change everything. It will change your entire davening. I guarantee you, if not, I give you your money back. That was a good question, excellent question. Next question. How can Shuvah be so powerful? Like in the story of Rebbe Lazen ben Durdaya. Is my tikkun part of what I have done only in this life? Or it's part of correcting sins that my neshama has done in previous reincarnations? Also, are you saying that our mistakes, our sins, our pure love from God to us, is this the way we can get better and grow? Excellent, excellent question. The answer to all these questions is as follows. Yes, ultimately what we are learning here is that once I have made a mistake, I have to understand that this is part of the plan. Before I make the mistake, I don't, don't, don't do it. After I make the mistake, I have to ask myself, how can I grow from this? Where is the love here? And make it become a springboard for transformation. And then you connect your world to God's world and your choice becomes God's choice. And then it becomes part of the mitzvah and your sin becomes a mitzvah. Is the tikkun only for this lifetime or also previous lifetime? It could be for previous lifetimes as well because we carry souls that have been here thousands of years and very often we are sent down to repair things that we couldn't repair in previous lifetimes. And finally, how do we do tshuva that is powerful? It's, it has to be genuine. These are not things that we can just give lip service to. When somebody really becomes connected to themselves, they work on themselves through meditation, through prayer, through introspection, through Torah, through connecting to real people, being vulnerable, being raw, that allows us to become authentic and it allows us to pour our heart out and to experience genuine, genuine growth, genuine transformation. Next question. Probably there's, there's somebody possible. that wants that wants to ask live. It's possible. Sure, sure, sure. Let me put him live. Rafa, si, si quieres eh, quitar mute y prender tu cámara para poder preguntar en, en vivo. Hola, soy Hanna. ¿Qué tal? Hi, Rabbi. Hello, hello. So, how can we understand sins without talking about consequences? We learned from Madame Richon the consequence was that they went out of the, of the Gan Eden. So those, those uh, things are teaching us something. So it's not just that I really, um, ¿cómo se dice? Me arrepiento. I, I really do chuba, but I need to know that everything in life has consequences. Yeah, that's true. So we need to be like a little, not afraid, but to be careful. 
A hundred percent. And that. A hundred percent. Everything we do has consequences. Every mitzvah has consequences. Every sin has consequences. And as we go into those consequences, we then have to realize that those consequences themselves are ultimately here to bring us to a deeper and greater place. But there are consequences. So it's not just that I, I commit something wrong and then I just say with all my love, please forgive me, God forgive me, is that I knew that it, I was doing something wrong and I did. So the basic element of tshuva is, I feel remorse, I feel regret, I apologize, I say I'm sorry, and I make a resolution for the future, and then it's forgiven. The so, sin is wiped so, out. So the, the last thing is, I, so we need to understand that Adam Arishon was a, a, a partner with God in his sin, what do you think? <laughs> it's very sad. I, I would have pre uh, preferred him to stay in the garden. <laughs> uh, if you read the story very carefully, it says that God placed the tree of life in the middle of the garden. And then it says he placed the tree of knowledge. Doesn't say where. <laughs> Doesn't say where. And you may be able to interpret it that wherever he went, it was there. <laughs> wherever he went, it was there. And the question is, what were his choices at the time? Did he really, really have a choice to abstain from it or not? Is it maybe possible that he didn't have a complete choice and the choice that was given to him was only how he's going to respond afterwards in other words after he ate from the tree what happened god said did you eat from the tree he what could not. have he said he could have said yeah what did he say he, he started to blame he blamed his wife <laughs> so sometimes we're put into a situation where we go through something and that's inevitable the question is how do i respond to that do I respond to that in a way of blaming? I blame the world for my problems. I'm perfect. Everybody else has problems. Or I could say, I'm not perfect. I'm vulnerable. I'm weak. I made a mistake. And now let's heal together. And that changes everything. Instead of creating this image of perfection that Adam did, I'm perfect. My wife, my wife, she's the one who destroyed my life. By that, by doing that, he distanced himself from God. He sent himself out of paradise. Because by becoming a person who blames other people, you distance yourself from God. I'm perfect. You're to blame. He, did, he, lost, he lost his relationship. There's a different approach. The approach is, no, I have nobody to blame. I made a mistake. And I need you to be here with me in my mistake. I need you to be here for, with me. He couldn't believe that God is with him. So he had to say, I'm perfect. I never ate. Eve ate. That moment he separated himself from Hashem because he had to create this image of perfection in order to be with God. And that way he separated himself from God. It's very, very deep. When I make a mistake, the greatest way I can be with God is in my mistake, in the brokenness. You remember the metaphor with the broken vessel? Yeah. That's what allows the light to come in. So Adam, he distanced himself from God. He said, oh, there's no way God is going to be here with me anymore. God threw me out. So he blames his wife to, to save his own skin. And God says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You missed the point. You missed the point. I'm never going to leave you. I can't leave you. We're one. You and I are one. I'm going to be with you forever. Don't send me away from your life. Don't think you're too broken for me to be here. You're never too broken for me to be here. On the contrary, 
I'm always here wherever, wherever, wherever you are. You have to be able to lift yourself up and find me right here. The, the Pasuk says, you have to search for God where you lost him. <laughs> where you lost him, don't go somewhere else. Now, the Torah is very ambiguous about this. Is this true? It's one way of reading it. There's other ways of reading it also. This is not the only way of reading the story. I'm just giving you one perspective of reading the, of reading the story. It's based on Medrash Tanchuma. Medrash Tanchuma, Parashat Chukat, says that it was all a plot of God. <laughs> Thank you very much. Chatimat Tova. Chatimat Tova to you. And Thank you, Rabbi. And everybody, somebody says, somebody says, is there a way to connect to Hashem without sinning and doing tshuva? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Through Torah and mitzvahs. No question. That's the way of connecting to Hashem. Our point was that when we do make mistakes, we shouldn't think the connection is over. Now the connection has to become deeper. But of course you connect to Hashem through Torah and mitzvahs. Somebody says, I'm a Baal Tshuva and I feel a great connection with every mitzvah and with God. But now I see my daughter and my son's life. They were burnt. They had a religious education and I feel their connection with God are taken for granted. How can I help them to love and to connect with God the way I do. I don't feel that they have that passion. It's a good question. And that perhaps I think one way is of in a very kind and non-judgmental way, maybe share with them your experience. Share with them why you became a Baltrova. Share with them what you saw on the other side. So they should understand what prompted you and what motivated you. And I think then they'll be able to develop more of an appreciation. Maybe you, your husband, can share with them. I don't know if you should share everything. Perhaps not. Depends on the story. But perhaps you could share more about your own struggles and your own journeys so they can have an appreciation for it. Okay, my dearest friends, I love you all and I bless you with a Shana Tova, Gmar Chatima Tova, and an amazing year, a good Yom Tif and a good year. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you. You're all incredible people. And may your home be filled with light and health and blessings. And all of you should continue to go from strength to strength in your Torah, in your Avodat Hashem, in your Avat Yisrael, Avat Hashem, Avat Torah, and continue to be ambassadors of love, light, hope, healing, authenticity, and redemption. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. The same to you. And my conclusion is that we have to have you here in Mexico for a Shabbaton. When all, all this business finishes, so we will have you here. <laughs> Thank you. You should know that from all my journeys around the world, the, the, my visit to Mexico a few months ago, when was it? Eight months ago, before the corona, was very unique. Usually there's a lecture. And after the lecture, everybody goes home. Sometimes they have a little reception. But you guys, the main party started at midnight. And I think we got home like four in the morning. So that was a very unique and memorable, uh, memorable visit. At the end of the night, I thought maybe there'll be two and a half people, but there was quite a large crowd. So <laughs> that was quite an eye opener for me. Yeah. And we means, will re- means that you guys know, you guys know that the purpose of life is not to make a living. The purpose of life is to live. And you make a living in order to live. Here That's in it. America, it's the other way around. People live in order to make a living. <laughs> so that's a very special blessing. That you make Thank a you. living in order to live. You don't live in order to make a living. And we're, we're going to live with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. thank you, Rabbi. And thank you for everything. Bye-bye. My love and blessings. Hatzlacha. Thank Shana you. Tova. Shana Tova.